Let me uh, start a timer really quick so I don't go over. All right. Hey, my name is Max. I used to live in Portland, and uh, now I'm down in the Bay Area doing my nerd pilgrimage for a couple years. It feels really good to be back here. Um, I Basically, at the beginning of this year, in January, I started working in 3D for the first time. And uh, there's a few things that made that happen, and I'd like to talk about why and then what has happened since then in the five, five and a quarter months. Um, basically, I've been doing 2D for so long, and I've broken out of the mold of rectangles, and I've now gone into cubes. So I'm not yet at triangles. I only do right angles, so I'm taking baby steps. But um, I made some slide presentation software yesterday for my talk today. So I have... Um, here is uh, the project. It's called voxel.js. If you want, um, if it's hard to see these, you can go to uh, my Twitter, twitter.com slash maxogden. The last tweet is a link to this. It's up on GitHub. Um, so this is some software that I've, that I've been collaborating on with a number of people, many of which are in the room, like Substack, who I live with when, in Oakland, Chris Dickinson, who's written all the physics. Like when I go like this, that's like five of Chris's modules acting together in harmony. Um, and so it's super fun. We have little, little characters that can walk around. And uh, it's, it's just like a really, really entertaining project to work on. Because every day that I work on it, I get more motivated to work on it. Um, and once it got out there, people started doing mind-blowing things with it. And I'd like to show off kind of what the community has done and how we went about building it um, with Node. So um, the first thing I did when I started the project was I realized that so many people have written voxel stuff that I should just copy them. So uh, what I did was went to GitHub search. And uh, let me get out of full screen here. And so if you do a GitHub search for um, Minecraft and you filter by JavaScript, there's uh, 23 pages of repos. And what I did was I went through all 23 pages. Um, and if I find, there's this folder. So these are all the repos that I um, cloned when I was doing my research. And I read the source code of each one. So I went through all 23 pages of the GitHub search results. I, cloned, I read the ones that seemed promising, um, cloned them down, got them running, understood how they work. That took a week of my life. It was December, Christmas break time. I just finished up a job. I was looking for something to do. Um, and I saw a couple demos that were really promising. But um, they were the classic uh, genius programmer projects. So they were really impressive visually, but the code was super, super hard to understand. It was a giant lib folder with like 50 files. Everybody rolled their own 3D engine. I had never actually done any 3D game program before. I got into coding through StarCraft, making custom StarCraft levels in like 99. Um, but since then, I hadn't touched games because I've been too busy with code. So um, I, was, I was pretty intrigued. Um, and so the next thing that I did was I found out about this project called 3JS. Um, and 3JS is made by Mr. Doob, this amazing demo scene dude who works at Google. And basically, just his job is to make 3D in the browser easy and fun. And um, 3JS has been my crutch throughout this project. I encourage you to go check out the projects on this page on the 3JS website and play with them. Um, so after I did uh, some hacking with 3JS and kind of got acquainted with stuff, um, I made this website for a project. So uh, for about a week or two weeks, I think we, we released it on like January 10th. I started working on it on January 1st. Um, I, I worked on it for a few days. I combined all the stuff that I had seen. Um, there's actually this guy named Makola Lysenko. And uh, it's, if you check out his blog, it's um, Minecraft Meshes. He runs this blog called zerofps.wordpress.com. And he's uh, working on his PhD in computational geometry. And he's literally written the math behind Minecraft and how to render it. And this has been super helpful to me. Um, the thing that really pushed me over the edge to work on it is his demo, um, which is here. And his blog is amazing for many reasons, but this is one of the demos that he did in 3JS. So he used 3JS in order to get the point across to readers on his web blog. But um, when you look at stuff like this, like so he, he would render a voxel volume, and then he would show different rendering techniques. So in this case, um, every vertice internal to this object is still being rendered. So there's a lot of, th there's a lot of work being done that the, the player would never see. So he wrote these algorithms that can remove interior faces and dramatically improve, improve rendering performance. And so it started with about 300,000 points. And this one gets it down to 20,000 points. This one gets it down to about 4,000 points. So I saw this, and I was like, wow, that's an amazing piece of work that's already done. I'm going to build on top of that. Um, so let me get out of here. 
Um, so building on McCullough's work, I um, made a project called VoxelJS, which you can now see at voxeljs.com. There's um, a bunch of demos, like an insane amount of demos. I don't have enough time to show them all, but I'm going to try to show all the cool ones. But go out here and play around. There's also a list of all the modules that come from the community that have been written. So each one of these is a node module. They're up on NPM, and we use Browserify um, to, to manage our build process. If you, at the very bottom of the page, there's actually some tutorials. Um, there's a video that somebody did about how to get started writing modules, how to use, make your own game. And if you make something with it, send me fan art, and I'll put it on the website. Um, so our, I want to talk a little bit about kind of the meta stuff, like why use Node? All this stuff runs in the browser, and it's a 3D programming game. It's like has nothing to do with Evented I.O. or Node or anything like that. Um, but it turns out that Node has kind of like the best package manager of all the package managers, and it works great for client-side code. In our case, um, if you search on NPM, you go to the NPM website or you do NPM search from the client, now there's over 100 voxel modules. Uh, only about 10 or 15 have been written by me. So it's, it's insane. The community has totally taken the Node module format and has been writing it writing 3D, game, 3D games for the browser with it, um, and it's totally working. So when you hear people say, like, NPM, that's just for Node stuff, like, that just means they haven't yet used NPM for client-side stuff. So some of the tools that have come out of the Voxel.js um, workflow, um, Browserify is written by Substack, and we use that. It basically lets us, what all Browserify does, plain and simple, is if you have a bunch of modules, it puts them into one JavaScript file so you can run it in your browser. So if, if you have module A that requires module B, you don't want to have to make two HTTP requests or some crazy stuff like that. You just run it through Browserify. Browserify figures out all the modules you need to combine and gives you one JavaScript file that you can run. It's almost like um, compiling a static bundle and then you get it executable you can run in your browser. So Browserify is um, really, really, really useful. And it basically lets you use the power of NPM, the power of the Node community. Anybody that publishes a module, you could start hooking into your app programmatically. No more downloading a file, putting it into your JS file, adding a script tag, making sure it's like jQuery-1.4 and not jQuery-1-3 or whatever. Um, another tool is to rapidize the development process, this thing called Beefy. Beefy as a server, it uh, started as Browse Servify, but it was, it was too hard to pronounce. Chris Dickinson actually writes this, uh, or he maintains this project and wrote it. And, you install Beefy, you run a server, and uh, it gives you a static file server, but every time you request um, the JavaScript file of your source code, you could write code with requ require statements in it, just like Node, and every time Beefy gets a request for that JavaScript file, it goes out to Browserify and gives the result bundle back to the browser. So you can kind of have, like, every time you refresh, you get the newest bundle, and it makes the development process really awesome. So if you look up Beefy on NPM, there's instructions of how to get started in using that. Um, I use it in my workflow. Um, the other thing is um, Node itself uh, has this, you've heard a lot about it in the last presentation, especially about how there's kind of a module, a small module ethos in parts of the people that use Node. And I've been working on this book um, in the time that I don't want to write code, I've been writing words. And it's kind of like what I've learned from the Node community about what Node is supposed to be for. Like, what kind of things is Node intended for? What are some of the ideas behind it that you might not get if you just work on things like um, CRUD applications on the web? You can do crazy stuff. People were flying helicopters with them yesterday. Um, I'm making 3D games. J James is inventing new audio synthesis. It's like you can really push the limits in a lot of areas, especially now that JavaScript has awesome like binary support and other things. So um, if you look up this book, um, I'm, I'm working on making it really accessible, kind of like a, a free little tiny ebook pamphlet kind of thing. Um, to understand some of the theory about, okay, why are they using Node again? I still don't understand. This would hopefully answer some of those questions. Um, I also wrote a, uh, an article specifically about um, the experience that we had on the first month of the project to give some more background, some stuff that I won't have time to get into here. Um, you can go read this article on my blog, and it talks um, about some of the other, the other stuff that I can't fit in this presentation. Um, I think I accidentally had the wrong link on the other thing, but whatever. So um, let's see, where, in terms of demos, where should I start? So uh, I realized that I needed a way um, for non-coders to kind of get into it because there were all these fun game worlds that people were writing, but they, it was basically people that already knew Node. Because we used the NPM package format, Anybody that knew NPM was automatically easy. It made it easy for them to contribute because it's like, oh, you can do 3D and put it on NPM. But people that didn't have a good command line grasp, maybe they were newer programmers, they'd never used Node before. I was working on um, this app for a while, 
But uh, the goal of this was to, I, I worked on um, making an all-in browser developing experience. So it gives you some Hello World code. You can hit play, and it'll um, build your game dynamically. And then you can basically have like a, um, a rapid development loop where you can tweak your game, go back to play, and um, go back and forth and edit your thing, and then publish it to GitHub. You OAuth into GitHub, and it saves it as a gist. And then one of the cool things about it is that if you take a gist ID and append it to the end, you can look at any gist that people have put on here. So here's some of the cool stuff people have made with this in-browser tool. Um, this one is actually a full Tetris implementation. Um, so uh, we have a Tetris game. If you click on the right wall, it goes right. If you click on the left, it goes left. And if you go, to go down, it um, stamps it down. Also, since it's you know, a full 3D uh, a thing, the gravity's turned way up. You can stand on top of the blocks, which is kind of fun. Let me wait for so you could like play Tetris from above. <laughs> and then there's an Easter egg. Um, one of our contributors wrote a 3D positional audio uh, module. And if you stand at the bottom, you can't hear it. It's only my computer, but the Tetris theme plays the, the closer you get to the blocks. And um, if you fail, it resets. So it's, it's a full implementation. You could play it. It's awesome. Um, and then another one that's really fun is uh, a voxelization demo. So this loads in from Thingiverse, which is a 3D printing repository, this um, big face. And it um, scans over and fills it with blocks dynamically. So we can do things like, um, this doesn't import color and the face is sideways. Um, but if we, you know, this was like a proof of concept. So we can take any 3D object and turn it into voxels. We could also do stuff like um, try to automatically color map it. And um, this got me thinking about building a CAD software with voxel.js. You know, it, it gets crazy really quickly. Um, so after I made the code editor, I still haven't had time to work on that. And by the way, um, so far I've mentioned something like 40 modules total. There's tons of ways to contribute. You can work on existing modules. You can help me make better logos for any of the projects. If anybody wants to do any of this stuff, it's all on GitHub. It's all linked through the Voxel.js website. Um, the code editor thing, I'm working on newer versions of that. I wanted to make it, I want to make it really easy for people to write code with require statements in the browser and then have 3D games pop up, because I think that's a really compelling combination of things. Being able to have all of NPM at your fingertips in the browser without having to set up an environment. Um, some of the stuff that Chris Dickinson is doing, like implementing all of Git in the browser, is specifically so we can do things like make really rich editing experiences where you can Git clone the newest version of something. Or um, in this game, there's assets that have to get loaded. There's block assets for the, the textures for the blocks and for the player. And um, all these blocks are actually PNGs. And um, that's a lot of HTTP requests. So it'd be nice if we could just send a tarball, stream, parse the images out of the tarball, and dynamically load them into the WebGL scene. Um, so Chris has been working on things like implementing inflate, deflate, um, gzip, gunzip, all in client-side JavaScript. So um, streaming I.O. has a really important use case in the web for 3D, because you want these, you, know, you don't want to ever have to sit there for like five minutes where like you're watching a loading bar. It's like, let me play right away. Um, so another thing that I did, this is actually a separate code base, and it's a fork of a Mr. Dube project, but I added some sugar to it. Um, I wanted to make it even simpler. If you didn't know how to code at all, I still wanted a, you to have like a creative outlet. So um, there's this website that my girlfriend was working at for a while um, called DIY.org, and they have all these skills. DIY is awesome. Um, and my girlfriend, Jessica, just did a contract. She was building out the hacker skills for them. And as part of that, I was like, hey, you guys have a block builder skill you're working on because Minecraft is really popular with kids. Um, so they have this challenge called Make a Block Creature, and they link to my app on here. And so there's all these kids making insane block creatures in this app. This is basically, um, it's implemented in Canvas. It's not 3D. It's a 2D Canvas. Um, so it's not as fast as WebGL, but it runs on like every device. So you can basically place blocks, um, rotate around, and you could change your color and, and do different colors. And it's basically like a little tiny uh, 3D MS Paint or something. Um, and I let you kind of customize the view and stuff like that. But the cool part is, let me reset here. If you look at the recently made critters, these are all made by like 12-year-olds. This kid made Mario, like a Mario model. Um, he said it took him three hours. And he... And it was like the frame rate drops when there is like 3,000 voxels or whatever. Um, he also made Mega Man. Um, the, the fun part of building this is seeing what people make, and it's already blown my mind. There's a lot of amazing stuff in here, like um, 
this is some straight up like origami, um, really cool like tile art that somebody put on here, like almost like a weird castle. And uh, the really big ones, they, uh, they start chugging along, so I have to, maybe I'll have a WebGL version so I can handle more cubes. Um, but I highly encourage you to check this out. Um, the way that, this is a quick hack too, there's a module behind this. Instead of a database for vo storing voxels, I just steganographically encode the voxel data over on a bit mask um, in the least significant RGB values of the PNG. So the PNG is the save file. So if you load the PNG, all I do is I load the PNG into the browser, put it in a canvas, read the voxel data, and reconstruct the voxel creature. Um, so all the, the PNGs can be tweeted out and reloaded. The first thing that I used was, uh, I used Twitter as the database for this app, but then I got rate limited, so then I used a CouchDB. But, um, so there's all sorts of crazy tricks. When you start having to do things really fast in 3D and store lots of data, you, you start, it's like what keeps me up at night now, but in a good way. Um, and also, people ask a lot, like, do you have a day job? And no, I don't right now. I'm trying to just do this as much as possible because it's so much fun and it's super rewarding. So I figure that if I dump enough passion into this, it'll turn into a day, jo day job eventually. Um, so that has been a super fun app. My goal with the, the app I just showed you is once kids um, can start building their own games and have like drag and drop um, NPCs, I want to work on an editor where you can be in a voxel.js game like this and you could just browse the critters, drop a critter in and assign it behavior. Substack has um, a spider module, if you look up voxel spider, where it kind of follows you around and jumps up at you and its legs move up and down. Um, so let me uh, build a little um, platform to get up to the next level here really quick so I can see. So um, another app, so as an example of the modular level of this stuff, um, this is a module. So there's like, this is one that I wrote based on code that I found somewhere where you take the Minecraft skin format, which is on the right, it's just a PNG, and then you map it to a series of um, rectangles and cubes. And so we have a module that just lets you load a Minecraft skin and you get a 3D object that you can place in the scene. Um, that's kind of like the, there's so many modules, I can't even talk about them all. Lately what I've been working on, or actually, um, is like, so the first four months of the project was like 3D rendering, learning how that works, learning how to texture things. Physics was strangely missing from JavaScript. Um, there was an API for pointer lock where you can take over the mouse cursor and continuously do circles like this um, over and over. And that wasn't possible until like January, which is crazy, or like December. So browsers basically, it's possible now to do really compelling experiences like first person shooter, um, immersive 3D worlds. But um, there wasn't a lot of modules in the way of um, like first person controls and jumping and physics and collisions and stuff like that. So a lot of what happened over the first four months was I got help from people like Chris who, have, who has game development experience in Substack who has built underwater 3D robots in Alaska. Um, you know, those kind of people can, can come in and we can write some reusable modules. So now there's at least some modules in Voxel.js that are totally generic. There's one that abstracts pointer lock. Um, so you just get a stream of mouse deltas. Um, there's a keyboard control module that has key bindings across a bunch of different operating systems. There's a bunch of stuff that's totally reusable, not specific to voxels at all, that we just had to do to build a 3D game. And the only thing that I saw in terms of 3D games was there's like a couple by Mozilla where they cross compile from C++, but you can't reuse that code outside of the original use case. So we basically had to figure out like, first we have to implement a first person shooter, then we can start doing the Minecraft stuff. And before we can get to the Minecraft stuff, we have to figure out how to efficiently render all this terrain and um, so now we're kind of at the point where, okay, we have all the, the boring details figured out. Now we can start doing the fun stuff. And um, the reason I started this project was that Minecraft was way too hard to, to hack. It's closed source, but there's a modder community that decompiles it every version and then makes their own hacky SDK. Um, and so if you write a Minecraft plugin, not only is it hard to maintain and you it breaks on every upgrade. It's also super hard to, in, hard to install. So you, have to, you can't just install a plugin from the Minecraft client, you have to install a plugin installer that also goes out of date. And it's like this horrible, horrible process, yet it's still wildly popular because Minecraft is such a fun game to play. Um, so I figured, hey, JavaScript community is really good at reinventing things. Let's reinvent all of Minecraft, but as modules, and let people do whatever the heck they want. Like one thing that's annoyed me about Minecraft is that after they hit 1.0 about a year ago, the most exciting thing to happen to the Minecraft community is they release new 16 by 16 block textures every few months. They're not really doing anything with the platform that they have, and there's a lot of opportunities you can do with voxels. So one of them is 
This was the thing that blew my mind the first time I saw it. This is made by um, one of our contributors who writes a lot of the core modules now, and this was his first example. This is an early version of VoxelJS, so the sky, for some reason, is only half blue, but um, I think that's just, he has different screen resolution than I do. But, um, so here's a Parrot AR drone in the game. Um, if I tell it to, let me actually, let me go back up there, or I'll stand down here, whatever. So I'll tell it to take off, and then it takes off, and I can see what it sees. Um, and it can, so if I say uh, rotate, or no, I think I have to tell it clockwise at speed, I'll say speed 0 0.3. So it'll start spinning clockwise, and then eventually it'll see me standing down there. <laughs> and then I can, uh, now it's spinning clockwise, I can tell it to go up at like 0 0.5, or no, I'll do 0 0.4. Um, and then I'll tell it to uh, go right at 0 0.3. And now it's doing a corkscrew up into the air. And that's just, you know, the exact same API. It's actually, we browserified the Node AR drone package, what, which is what you use to write. It's usually it sends UDP commands, but instead we send it to WebGL. So it's the exact same JavaScript. It's not even the same API. It's the literal <laughs> library. So this is the power of browserify, right? It's like you can control a physical helicopter, or you can control a WebGL helicopter with the same file. Um, so I've heard from a number of people that they use this. Um, I'll, let me land it. They use this to, um, to test out, because the battery. Yeah. <laughs> I can build a tower here, looking down at my own chest. Um, oh, wait, maybe. Well, anyway, this is a weird, funky version that hasn't been updated in a while, but the demo is awesome. I actually implemented the logo uh, turtle script as well. So there's like um, the guy that started DIY.org actually wrote a streaming logo interpreter for Node, and it's on NPM. And then we, I made a module at his house called Logo Drone. So you could write logo commands too for this thing. But it's a great way to test out, you know, instead of wasting the battery on your copter, you can test out your routines on here. And then uh, it's a full drone emulator with uh, Perlin generated terrain and procedurally generated trees and um, it's, yeah, this is like 10 modules together to make this, this thing. And this was like, the, in, within the first month of releasing it, I got that, and my mind was blown, and I was like, okay, we're onto something here. Um, another thing that the same guy did, um, his name's Kyle, and he works um, for an online wine retailer in Sonoma, and he was interested in drones because he said that they wanted to do drone winery tours, but that they got like a takedown notice from somebody that said that it's not cool to fly drones above Sonoma Valley or something. But he just wrote this the other day. So if you've ever played Minecraft, there's the mining part, which is basically just putting cubes on top of cubes or digging holes. And then there's the craft part, and it's where you can synthesize items that you pick up. So if you go down into the ground and you find a bunch of diamond, you get a bunch of diamond blocks, and you could turn them into like a diamond axe or a diamond shovel. So um, with this, if I take, I think this is wood, if I take some wood and uh, you can hold, hold do control, just like Minecraft, it'll subdivide. Then I can get some sticks. And then if I, um, I take this back down, if I put my sticks in here, and I make like a shovel handle, and then on top of it I put this diamond, now I have a diamond shovel. So it's uh, all the, the recipes for Minecraft's crafting system and the UI are implemented in HTML5. Plus, there's this code editor here. You could define your own recipes on the fly. So it lets people be more creative than what Minecraft limits you to with their own recipes. Um, and this is a module you could basically install it and it makes the UI show up and it also hooks up into VoxelJS. So um, we're doing it piece by piece literally and there's lots of room for ideas like this. Um, then there's another project that just came out which is the um, GitHub archive room. Um, let me check how I'm doing on time. Okay, cool. So this was done um, by uh, somebody who asked a lot of questions in IRC but never told me what they were working on. And <laughs> Then they released this, and I was like, oh, I get it. So it's a GitHub uh, timeline visualization, kind of like the, you know, like the new green um, contribution graphs. It's like a 3D version of that that you can jump around in. Um, so it's pretty cool. You put in any, any project, and it generates a 3D calendar of the project and shows you the project evolving over time. And so you can kind of get an idea for like when the project was successful, when there was lots of commits, when the last fork was. Um, it's, it's a pretty sweet project, and it's really well done. Um, Archiveroom.net, if you want to play around with it. Um, let me go over here. Build a little thingy. Oops. 
That's okay. I can jump up. So um, this is another app that I did a couple weekends ago. And it's uh, two of my favorite things now, voxels and animated GIFs together. So uh, this uses a number of modules. One is this toolbar that I wrote, which um, is just npm install toolbar. has nothing to do with voxels. It's just a toolbar that you get events whenever you... Uh, it binds to keys and also binds to clicks. Um, and I just put little, little block types in there and set the block type of the game. So you could switch your block type um, and you can place blocks. So if I can switch over to wool and I can place wool blocks or I could place planks. And um, the other part of this game is somebody, well, actually, somebody 3D modeled me and sent me a pull request that's like, I made a skin of you, which is awesome. <laughs> um, and to see what I look like, I actually wrote this camera in the game. And you could go up to the camera, and every time you hit enter, it captures, um, <laughs> captures a shot from the camera. <laughs> and you can, you can change the camera angle by hitting X, and it looks where you're looking. Um, so you can kind of you can set up the scene, and you could say, okay, I want to do a shot of that, and then you could um, add a bunch of blocks on top, and then say, okay, take a shot of that, and then go around a little bit, get it from this angle, and then go around a little bit more and get it from this angle, and then let's do one from over here, and then if you hit export GIF, then it generates a GIF, and you could save it and share it or whatever. That was the whole idea behind the app, and. Um, one of the fun parts about this is I also, screwing around with stuff, I decided to implement like a 3D bulk editing thing. So there's all these different bulk operations. One of them is you can, you can hold down Shift and you start selecting a 3D region. So if you go over here, you hit Shift again, then it builds walls around where you selected. Um, and you can fly, I implemented double tap to fly, and so you can go into fly mode and kind of get like the bird's eye view of everything. And um, this bowl is actually just a giant um, sine wave, I think, or something. Um, and it's procedurally generated when the page loads. So there's walls. You can do things like, um, if I want to make it look like it snowed on the mountains, um, I can just like select a big region, and then it adds snow. A little laggy on that one. Let's see if I crashed it. It'll eventually get there. Maybe. <laughs> this is what I get for initializing like 30 WebGL contexts in one presentation. Well, whatever. Um, but that's, that's fun to play with. You can make GIFs. Uh, send me some GIFs that you made. One of the reasons behind that is that when I was in school, stop motion was one of my favorite things. And I always thought having a stop motion in Minecraft and GIFs would be really a fun thing to build. And it totally was. Um, so there's a couple more things. And so... So far, we have like the the rendering engine, and we have the player, and we have, um, but we don't have Minecraft Worlds yet. So, um, and we don't have multiplayer. So, let me show you a couple things. This is a multiplayer thing I did. There's a game competition called the Ludum Dare. It's a 48-hour game competition. You do it solo, and you're supposed to start from scratch, but you can use libraries. So NPM, I was like, does it count if you have like 90 NPM packages that you're going to use? <laughs> and you know that works, because all the game code was written within the competition um, time. So if you wanted to play, if somebody wants to go to this URL, um, we can see if the peer connection will work. This uses the new WebRTC peer-to-peer um, -peer connection, and it does a two-player multiplayer game. So if I hit find opponent, right now I'm the only one waiting, but I'll see if somebody connects. Oh, use Chrome, because Chrome and Chrome works, and Firefox and Firefox works, but right now WebRTC is incompatible between Chrome and Firefox. In practice, it is. Um, patch welcome. So here we go. So I'm connected to somebody. And if, they, if you click, oh, the other person maybe crashed or something. I'll just play against myself. Um, if I go over here, let me open up two of them. It's basically, the way this works architecturally is there's a lobby system. When you go to this page, you open up a web socket and you say, I'm here. And then uh, the next person that joins, they're like, oh, there's already somebody waiting. And then you go through this thing called ICE and STUN, which are parts of WebRTC that try to break through each other's routers and uh, get a direct data connection to the other person's computer. Once that's established, then you disconnect from the lobby system, and then you're just playing against each other, um, 
computer to router to router to computer. So um, it's true peer-to-peer, -peer and the gameplay is all computer to computer. There's no central server. So let me um, see if I can get in the same game as myself. Maybe. I can always do it locally. Now that there's people on here, there might, it might, be, there might be other people playing each other. Um, it's maxogden.github.com um, slash ludumdare26. And you can play on, there's, uh, a, I have a local version. So I'll just do the local one against myself. So this was really fun because I didn't need to set up anything except this lobby system, which can scale to like thousands of concurrent users because all they do is disconnect as soon as they start playing. So there's not really any data that gets transmitted. And then once you get into the game, it looks like this. So you have a countdown, and your job um, is to go over, well, there's a spout above each player that'll start spewing water. So if I, um, if I start making some blocks up here, the goal is to make as much surface area for the water to flow down, because once it hits the ground, it'll disappear. So you have to create as much of a cascade of water in your allotted time as you can. Um, and then you can go and look at the other player, and they can, they can say, like, hi, I'm a guy, and I'm looking up and down. And then when the water starts flowing, it um, basically does a flood fill down your cascade. And if you look at the other guys, that's kind of boring. He didn't do anything. But on this side, we got the water to flow down. And then uh, once it finishes flowing, then it does a count, and it says, okay, who had more blocks? So in this case, blue had 1,068 blocks, and green had 108, so blue wins. Um, and this, I had this for the demo purposes set at 30 seconds, but three minutes or five minutes tends to work. One of the fun things about this game is that um, you can go and troll the other person's fort. So at the last minute, you can go and delete their blocks, and then the water won't fall, flow down as much, so it has kind of like a um, different, different ways to play the game. But the fun part about this is that this is all peer-to-peer. -peer. Like when I move the player... It sends commands over UDP, over WebRTC. So it's unreliable right now. They don't have reliable WebRTC in Chrome. Um, but what I do is I just send a buffer of operations so that it's more likely that all the stuff is um, getting to the other side. So whenever you place blocks, um, most of the time it gets through, and depending on the network quality, it, it might not. But I send the last five blocks that you place every single time. Um, so I already have like two-player multiplayer working, and it's pretty reliable, and it requires no server infrastructure. Um, and I'd be interested if anybody wants to help hack on like an MMO version using peer-to-peer -peer and get into some crazy DHT stuff with gossip protocols and uh, we should, you should write some modules for that, like npm install MMO, that'd be awesome. Um, so you can play that online, uh, hopefully, I think the lobby system works, it's just you have to, there's no like Chrome Chrome matching or Firefox Firefox matching, so sometimes we get disconnected, but um, not bad, it wasn't, I got, I got a multiplayer 3D game working in 48 hours from scratch, which was like, I was happy about that. Um, oh, I should mention I used this thing called Peer.js, which is um, some Berkeley students that I met um, work on it, and it's an abstraction layer on top of WebRTC that's cross-browser compatible as much as possible. So that made um, hacking on that stuff really fun. That's available on NPM as well. Um, so the last thing that I want to mention, um, I have like under 10 minutes left, is... Um, now, finally getting to the Minecraft stuff. So there's one of the cool parts about Minecraft is that there's all these insane um, worlds that people make. And so this is uh, from a couple weeks ago. I got um, Manhattan rendering. Uh, there's a project that recreated Manhattan in, uh, in the 1940s, a historical reenactment, basically, or like recreation of Manhattan all in a Minecraft server. So what people do is they set up a Minecraft server. You have to run like a really beefy Java server. So it's, it's um, hard to deploy. But once you get them up, uh, you can have like up to 40 people playing, collaboratively editing. And some people get on there on private servers and they do build outs. Um, there was a team of people that did Oakland in Minecraft. And it was 12 year old kids and their mom runs the server for them. And the mom got money from the Oakland Museum to run the server. And she's like, I'll have the kids go into Street View and build all of downtown Oakland. And they did in 10 days. Um, so if you Google Minecraft Oakland, it's really impressive. So um, let me, this will take a second to parse. So what this is doing is um, it's loading the actual Minecraft level into the browser, um, directly binary parsing the Minecraft world format. And um, I wrote like seven modules to do that, including parsing all the different block types and 
all the different things. But then what you get is you get um, this, uh, this region of Manhattan in the 1940s, and there's the Empire State Building. Um, and we have a couple, there's uh, somewhere there's Penn Station around. Um, and to do an example of, you know, the quality of how far along are we, let me open up actual Minecraft. No, I don't want to update and break everything. And then I'll go into single player mode in the NYC map as it is. This is what people saw when they, they worked on um, Minecraft NYC. This is what it looks like. So it's taking a second to load. Um, but here's the Empire State Building in there. And let me try to get the same vantage point. There's this WC Tower thing. So in that version, it looks like that. And then over here, it kind of looks like this. So this is kind of the status, is that I have, um, well, it's hard to see, I guess. Maybe if I move this down a little bit. I might move this up. Um, side by side, here's Minecraft, and uh, here's Voxel.js. So it's pretty close. Um, there's some detail stuff to do, but um, Minecraft runs at about 15 frames a second, um, and I have like, 40 plus on here, which is awesome. So um, loading about the same region, like amount of blocks. Uh, maybe Minecraft's loading a little bit more, but it's like flat stuff. But um, I've been working on trying to get um, the performance stuff up the last few weeks. And part of that is there's 400 block types in Minecraft. So uh, what I have to do is get 400 PNGs, combine them into a texture atlas, and do like a bin packing algorithm. And there is a, there's a module for that too, um, unsurprisingly. And uh, let me show that really quick, because it's, it's another one of these general purpose modules. Um, it is called Atlas Pack. So this is the, the packing algorithm. Um, what it did is it just gener uh, dynamically generated this PNG, and you, could, you can get the Atlas export. And it gives you this like single PNG Atlas, um, and it dynamically generates it from any PNGs that you want to put on here. So if I add like this player PNG, then it adds it into the Atlas. If I add like a green one, it'll put it in. Um, so what we do is we combine it, we make a, a single atlas uh, or sprite and use that for rendering. And that means that we're not sending 400 PNGs to WebGL every single frame, we're only sending one. That created an amazing performance increase. So now we're like 50 plus frames per second on all the demos. Um, so it's basically, we can render 400 or like hundreds of block types and hundreds of thousands of voxels in a scene and still be like 40 plus frames a second. Um, An other cool thing about WebGL is that it works on the newest BlackBerry mobile phones, it works on the newest Android mobile phones. There's a native iOS implementation if you make your own app. Um, so it'll run on iOS phones. It runs on um, Firefox OS phones, and it runs on other computers like desktop computers. But it's like on four major mobile platforms and uh, on the web. So we automatically get this stuff for free, and I'm really excited to build. There's some people that have prototyped touch interfaces for this stuff. Um, it's a really exciting time. Um, the thing that I'm working on next, let me get back in, um, is this thing called block plot. It's in super alpha beta mode right now. Um, it's just, I've been working on it for a couple weeks. Let me remember where, oh, I guess I'm not running it. But um, it doesn't really do anything right now, but um, it's a web app that I'm working on that will let you basically take your Minecraft files and upload them into the web and then share them with people so they can play them for free. And eventually I want to get to like a GitHub for Minecraft kind of level with the app where you can have a URL and people can fork your Minecraft world and send you a new building and you know, have all the, be able to export and 3D print buildings that you build in there and import things from Thingiverse or 3D model something from one program and voxelize it into your world or use those bulk editing tools and all sorts of stuff. Um, the possibilities are pretty immense. Um, let me make sure. So if I go into here, let me try a live demo. I'll import a Minecraft file. I have like the link to the past. Somebody did a Legend of Zelda implementation in Minecraft of the link to the past um, level. So this will, I don't have a progress bar hooked up. I just got this working like two days ago. But what it's doing is the Minecraft files are um, these big compressed binary blobs on disk. And depending on how big your world gets, you might have multiple. So you have to upload them one at a time. But um, they're essentially, they're in this weird format. They're 16 by 16 by 256 voxel sections. And there's 32 by 32 of those. So as you walk around, these big pillars show up in the game. 
there's a 32 by 32 or 1,024 of those per thing. Oh, we will wait. Um, and then, uh, so I have to parse all of those. It ends up being like 65, 556 times 1,024, whatever that number is. Um, it is like 671 million voxels or something like that. Um, and here we go. So it just parsed it and it stored it into level DB. Oh, maybe I had a texture bug there though. This might work and this might not work. Oh yeah, so it worked. So what I do with this is, uh, or let me fly up here really quick. It starts at the bottom. This is the bedrock in Minecraft and then there's all the underground. And in this map, there is no underground, but this is the um, Kakariko village uh, in Link to the Past, if you've ever played it. It was my favorite game as a kid. Um, and what I do is, instead of loading all 671 million voxels into memory, that would crash the browser tab. I'm working on making it faster, but this is where I am now. Um, I put them into IndexedDB, and I wrote a library um, called LevelJS. And LevelJS is uh, it's dot. It's an implementation of level up um, or level down. There's, there's level DB in Node, and it's a fast key value store. It's basically like the NPM install your own database components, and there's like 100 of them now. It's another one of these communities like Voxel that's flourishing because it allows people to pick their trade-offs instead of going with some database vendor and having to deal with their trade-offs. So uh, it worked in Node, and it's really super, super, super fast. But I wrote a version in the browser on top of IndexedDB that lets you store binary data. So um, I took all 671 million voxels, put them into IndexedDB, and that's what, why it sat there blocking the CPU for a while. I'm not using web workers in any of these demos yet because um, I'm, I'm going to wait until I absolutely need them. Um, but then what happens now is as, as you walk around, it'll, um, it'll dynamically load new regions of the game. We have some transparent texture bugs. So you, there's like all the, um, the huge region is loaded in here. You can kind of just go explore. Um, and if there's this uh, issue with the lag when you load the new chunks, um, and that's because I'm not using a web worker. I'm using the main thread, so to speak, in JavaScript. But um, this is where I'm at now. I'm, I'm working on getting this app uh, out there and so people can upload um, their Minecraft worlds and be able to share them. The only other way to upload Minecraft worlds is to use something like Mega Upload. Um, put them in a zip file yourself, put them on Mega Upload, expect people how to, to know how to download and find the hidden folder that Minecraft level files are saved in and uh, hope that they're using the same Minecraft version as you. So it's really, really, really hard to share what you've made in Minecraft, but like every 12-year-old in the world is doing 3D modeling today in Minecraft. There's just no way for them to share that stuff other than with screenshots. So I'm hoping to, to turn the kids doing 3D modeling into more of like an open web and hacker-friendly crowd and letting them share this stuff. That's the goal with the project. Um, this is all in GitHub, and um, I'm basically just going to work on making it fast and making it fun and then get it out there and see if people use it. Um, I think that's everything. I have no more blocks left. So uh, thank you.